Good to see you guys. Good to see you. Glad you're here at Forge. And uh, just a reminder that we go through, I mean, I know it's May and the school year is ending, but we go through all the summer. So uh, uh, just stay with us. Good to have you. Glad you are here. How many of you read, how many of you read Genesis 1, 2, and 3? Everybody, right? How many of you read Genesis 3 today? All right, good, 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 because you're going to need it because we're going to jump into it. Strap it in. Here we, here we go. I love the story uh, of the bookseller. You may have heard the, the story of the bookseller who came to the woman and said, what is your favorite book of all times? And she said, my husband's checkbook. <laughs> um, <laughs> Now that you say that's not politically correct, well, hey, the bottom line is he went to work, she stayed home and had babies. That's a lot of the way it works. There it is. Uh, and, uh, but hey, listen, our favorite book around here is the Bible. And we need God's word because it guides us. And we're in a series now, the very beginning of this series, First Things Genesis. We looked at Genesis 1 and 2 last week. But we're in a First Things series, God's story, his story, his way. And uh, we want to understand the beginning. We're talking about worldview. Uh, how you view the world says everything about you and me. Forge, what are we about? Building great men as God defines greatness. And that greatness begins when we uh, first bow the knee before Jesus Christ and recognize his greatness. Isn't it interesting that our greatness begins, starts, when we understand that there is someone greater than us, and it's Jesus Christ. That's how a man puts things into perspectives in our relationship with God. And so today, uh, we are going to uh, look at Genesis First Things, second talk. But I love this uh, quote from John Haggai. John Haggai has said a lot of good things, uh, and here's a quote from him. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated failures. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Well, how many of us agree that per, uh, persistence is important, right? Yeah, we all agree. It's, it's important. But, but it's not the essence of greatness. Uh, persistence is really important. Allensons have a motto, uh, Allensons never give up. I, and so that's one of our family mottos. We never give up, we wanna stay in the fight. However, greatness really has to come when we understand there is one who is greater than us and he sets the parameters for how we live our lives. That's crucial, guys. I, I love 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. Some of you won't like this, but here it is. Consider your calling brethren. There are not many wise according to the flesh. Look around this room as I say this. Well, maybe don't, no, just listen. There are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised things. God has chosen, catch this, the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boast, boast how? I, I go over this practically every day. This is one of these verses I go over every day. And I'm reminded that God has chosen the things that are not so that he could shame the things that are. I, uh, this, this, puts, this puts into perspective, doesn't it? Who we are. As men. Now that may tick you off a little bit, um, uh, but, but when we understand this, we get a world view. We get the proper view of ourselves. I did not hang the moon, and neither did you, and we're brothers. 
All right, well, in this talk, in this first talk that we looked at last week, we covered two chapters in Genesis. Did we cover ground or what? I mean, you come to Forge in the morning, you're getting a steak breakfast. That's what it is. We're going to get it again today in Genesis 3. But we looked in talk one, uh, first steps in building a worldview. Let me review, for those of you who weren't here last week, uh, 30 minutes of that message, and then we'll get in. Nah. Let me just review. We got some first steps of worldview last week. Number one, we saw that there is a God. Is that a worldview uh, change uh, for many people in this world today? There is a God, and He's generous and incredibly creative. Look at all the species that He comes up with. Look at what He He's powerful. He creates out of nothing. There is a God. We learned that there was a beginning. We learned, uh, contrary to what you might learn in schools today, that matter is not eternal. There was a time when things began. Uh, we don't know how many years ago that was. Uh, some Christians believe in a young earth, some believe in an old earth. The reality is there was a beginning. Mankind, we learned, is the special creation of a loving God. You are not an afterthought of the God of the universe. You have dignity because you were specially created. You're not the chance products of evolution that climbed out of primordial soup. You are a man with dignity. Uh, we have purpose. As long as we stay aligned with our Creator, we have purpose. And remember we saw that we are not only the creatures of God, but through Christ now, looking from the New Testament back, we're sons. And as sons, that'll never change in all time and eternity. Core identity, never change. And then we're leaders, workers, and warriors. That's all found here in Genesis. You hear me say that ad nauseum, don't you? It starts in Genesis. That's our worldview. And then we saw that mankind has two genders, male and female. Yes, indeed. And then uh, we also saw that the family unit is key. And anything that attacks the family unit goes against God's view of how the world ought to be. And then we uh, saw that God made a covenant of works with Adam. I didn't go into that much detail. Today, I'm going to post on Facebook, Forge Facebook, uh, just a small essay, small, small essay on the covenant of works and what's that, what that means. And then finally, we saw our, our worldview is shaped that when God created the world, how did he create? On the successive days of creation, at the end of each day, what did he say? It was good. It was good. It was five times. It was good. Six day, he looked at us. And he said, very good. And so, uh, and so history, creation is his story, right? Uh, and, and so uh, if you're going to be a great man, as God defines greatness, you got to understand the real world. Genesis 1 and 2 tells us the real, ultimate nature of reality. But then, if God created all things good, the man who looks around has to ask the question, what? Oh yeah? If God created it good, if God created it perfect, why is the world the way it is? I often ask guys, why do you do what you do in the way you do it? And often guys go, I don't know, I just do it. I know. We need to have a little self-evaluation. Uh, but, but the big question for us as we look at the world is we say, well, if God created all things good, what happened? What in the world happened? That's what Genesis 3 is about. Uh, Genesis 1 and 2 ramp up the drama, and the drama is about ready to crank up. So talk two is how to understand the chaos. That's what we're going to look at right now. And you've got an outline. Let's jump into it. Five acts. Five acts. Act 1 uh, reminds us about the tempter and the temptation. Here it is, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the, of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the tree, fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
So God created a perfect world, but it got bad. How did it get bad? It started in act one, the tempter and the temptation. And here we see this. Now, I want to tell you something about this fall account. You understand what I mean by fall? Point two is going to be rebellion, and that's really the fall. Theologians in the church have called this chapter the fall chapter, the most discouraging chapter in the entire Bible. And the way I look at it is, did Adam fall? Yes. Did he trip? Like, oh, made a mistake. No, he walked into rebellion. So there's a little bit about calling it the fall that is misleading. He didn't accidentally make a mistake. He walked into it. But, um, but this fall account, I want you to know this I, because this is so important. Moses wrote this down. Remember when the Israelites were being led out of Egypt? They're in the desert. He's writing all this stuff down. He's got about a million Jews or so. And, and he's trying to change their worldview because as we said last week, how, how do the Jews at this point in history, following Moses out of Egyptian bondage, they've been in 400 years, how do they think? What's their worldview? Do you remember? They think like Egyptians. They think like Egyptians. And Moses say, no, 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 you're God's people, and I want to change your worldview. I want you to start thinking uh, like the Jews that you are, right? And so he's changing their worldview, and he wants us to have uh, his worldview. But Moses wrote this down about 13 to 1400 B.C. I believe in an early date of the Exodus. And so uh, scholars tell us that uh, there are other, but you know there are other creation accounts, right? There are older creation accounts. Uh, the Sumerian uh, creation account, uh, the Babylonian creation accounts were written down even earlier than Moses wrote this down. Why? Because the early idea of creation was in mankind's history. And they came up, the Sumerians came up with this, a, a creation account, the Babylonians came up with a creation account, uh, but none of them we're right on. That's why God gives Moses the account to tell what really happened. But none of these ancient creation or flood accounts have a fall account. But the Bible does. Why? Because, because Moses is telling us, and remember that Jesus supported the Old Testament, Luke 24, 44, everything written about me and the law and the prophets is true, Jesus said. Jesus supported Moses as authoritative, and Moses says, and other people, all these ancient civilizations lost this idea of the fall, because they don't believe there was a good and holy God who created all things, and it fell. And it's important for you to understand uh, that this fall account is unique. Now, the players in verses 1 through 5 are, what are the, who are the players? We got a serpent, and we got the you got the woman. Now, can we talk? <laughs> Eve should have known something was wrong. Because she was made in the image of God, we learned in Genesis 1 and 2, taken from the side of Adam. And the animals are not made in the image of God. I know you think your dog is. It's not. Is your dog going to go to heaven? I don't know. It's like the little boy that called into the talk show and asked the guy, uh, asked the preacher, is my dog going to be in heaven? He said, I don't know, son. I've heard that so many times. When you get to heaven, call him and see if he shows up. Um, but the reality, I don't know if your dog's going to be in heaven. I don't know. But I know this, that your animals are not made in the image of God. And Eve should have been a little shocked that a, that a serpent was talking to her. Should have been the first tip off. Um... But something's talking to her, and, um, and, and the Bible says that the serpent is the most crafty of animals, and they really are crafty. I mean, snakes today are pretty crafty, right? You sit in a deer, I was in a, I was in a hunting stand the other day, and, and 20 turkeys walked by. Sounded like a herd of buffaloes walking through the leaves. Pigs come. They grunt and groan, and groan. Uh, deer, pretty quiet. I see the raccoons, but I, from up high, I never see the snakes. They're crafty. They're sneaky. And this serpent, we know from Revelation 12, 9, listen, 
And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. The worldview that Moses wants us to see is that in Act 1 of Genesis chapter 3, the spiritual war was on. How long did Adam and Eve live before the temptation and the tempter showed up? We have no way of knowing. When we get home to heaven, we'll find that out. Don't worry about it now. We don't know. But, uh, uh, but she, was, she was surprised by this. And the serpent, what does a serpent do? He asks sly questions. Did God really say that? Are you sure? How does Satan work with you and me as men following Christ at the beginning of the 21st century? He likes to undercut what is clearly the revealed will of God. Does God really, God loves you. He wants you to be happy, so steal it. God wants you to have all you want, so cheat. But God wants you happy. You're his kid. You're the king's son. You want to have an extramarital affair? Do it. Sex before marriage? No big deal. Do whatever you want. God is not going to discipline you. That's how Satan works. He ramps up and then he comes straight out and he says, God's wrong. He's holding out on you. And don't you believe it for a minute. Because God created all things good, and he created it good that you and I would live for him. Act 2, the rebellion, verses 6 through 7. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, then the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Eve bought the lie. Eve bought the lie. Let me give you a principle of biblical interpretation that I gave to our team leaders last Friday. Team leaders, you remember? What was the principle? Some of you were there, some of you weren't there. The principle of biblical interpretation that I gave you last Friday was the analogy of faith, which is simply this. Scripture interprets Scripture. In other words, if you keep reading long enough, the Bible explains itself to us. And, and another principle we gave was the essential clarity of the Bible. Just keep reading, and the Bible explains itself. So by the time you get to 1 Timothy 2, Paul says this. He says, it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Eve was tricked, and she got her husband and said, hey, I've learned something new. Come on, let's do this. Let's eat. It's good and we'll be wise. And he goes, okay. <laughs> Adam was not deceived. Adam was not deceived. He walked right into it. And how does the New Testament, who, where did, how does the New Testament place the blame for this? On Eve? Yeah, Adam and Eve really messed up. Nope. Who does it single out? Adam. Romans 5, in Adam, all die. In Christ, all shall be made alive. Not an Adam and Eve. Why? Because Adam was the federal head of the human race. He was the leader of the human race. He was responsible and he let down. He got passive. So their eyes were open. They saw their guilt and their shame. And, uh, uh, and, and notice, notice, interestingly, that when there is sin, two things come, guilt and shame. And they're not the same, but they're related. Guilt is I have done bad. Shame is I am bad. Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever, when I was, okay, when I was a Boy Scout, I, I, I was at a camp and I cussed and my scoutmaster heard me. I know it surprises some of you that I would ever utter an expletive, but I did. And I cussed and he, and he caught me. I turned around and I go, oh man, sorry. And he goes, are you sorry because you did it? You sorry you got caught? And I go, shoot, that's the first time I ever heard that. And I dialed it through my thinking. I said, the right answer is, I'm sorry I did it. Was I sorry I did it? Heck no, I was sorry I got caught. <laughs> that's the reality. 
Uh, I didn't feel any shame. I was with my buddy. So guilt is I have done bad. Shame is I am bad. And what eventually happens is that they both knew that they had broken the law of God and become lawbreakers. And then they felt shame. And you, you and I dwell in the land of sin long enough. Not only will we be guilty with God, but we'll start to feel bad and feel less because of our sin. Even as a Christian. You wallow in sin and go after it, you and I are going to feel shame. We're going to feel bad, and Satan is going to say, yeah, why are you living there? But that's what they felt, and that's what happened. Romans 5, in Adam all die. Act 3, the divine confrontation. By the way, you want to understand people? You want to understand yourself? You want to understand the people that you're dealing with? They are fallen, they are guilty, and they feel shame. A lot of people feel this and are living in that world. It's amazing. Act three, the divine confrontation. God shows up, eight through 12. This is absolutely amazing. I'm not going to read it all uh, because we don't have enough time, but you can read it later. But it says that they heard the Lord of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And I love this. Where are you? Does God not know where they are? God is sovereign. He's omniscient. He knows where they are. Uh, where are you? I heard the sound of you in the garden, Adam said, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Guilt and shame are powerful forces. With guilt and shame, what do we try to do? Number one, we try to cover up ourselves, right? Cover up, the cover up, and then the hiding takes place, and then the blame game. Don't you love, don't you love Adam here? The woman you gave me. You gave her to me. I didn't ask for you. You're the one that took her out of my side. Didn't ask for this. I was happy in my single life. And then the Lord God said to the woman, he turns to the woman, what have you done? The serpent, I was deceived. In all fairness, I like Eve at this point. At least she understood. I was, see, I was tricked, I was deceived, she's honest, Adam isn't. Um, men of grace do not, now on this side of the cross, when we sin, we do not have to hide we do not have to cover up. We do not have to blame other people for our sin. And one of the biggest freeing moments comes when you can say, I'm sorry I was wrong. To your wife at work. I said that recently. <laughs> I got passive like Adam got passive, made a, made a mistake, had to clean it up. I'm sorry I was wrong. Jesus forgave me. He'll forgive you. That's why he went to the cross. Um, a major theological question these days is, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around, is it still the man's fault? <laughs> we live in a day and age in which it seems like we're blamed for everything. But um, at least Eve was honest and she took responsibility. And we can too. Guys, I don't expect any of you to be perfect. Do you expect yourself to be perfect? Can you forgive yourself when you mess up? That's hard for some of us because we want to put on the exterior and we always want to be right and we never want to come humbly to the cross. <laughs> but guys, I think a real man can say, I was wrong. Because of Jesus, he paid for it. And I'm okay. I'm still God's deeply beloved, redeemed son. Act four, here we go. The divine consequences. The Lord God said to the serpent, on your, what guys? On your belly. So apparently the serpent was at this point an upright animal. Now we see him on the belly. We get home to heaven. We'll find out more about that. Um, every serpent I've seen has been on his belly. 
walk, walking in our neighborhood the other day, we saw one. The snakes come out this time of the year, by the way. And uh, there was a little snake down there. It was a cute little rat snake or something. I don't know. But um, he's on his belly. No arms, no legs, no appendages. Um, but notice this. He says, uh, verse 15, I will put, this is one of the most important verses in Genesis. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the what? This, almost all Christian theologians down through biblical history, church history have said, this is what's called, don't, you won't have to remember the name, but it's called the Proto-Evangelium, the first sign of the gospel. The first sign of the gospel. The serpent's head's going to be crushed by the seed of the woman. Yeah, the serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. Yeah, yeah, the woman's seed. And usually we don't think of a woman's seed. We think of the man's seed. But interestingly, it brings up this female seed issue. Um, and and so, so the head of the serpent's going to be crushed after bruising the heel. And this is a direct reference uh, all theologians, uh, almost all theologians down through church history see as a, as a future reference to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Go back and watch the movie, The Passion of the Christ, when you get a chance. I know Easter's already come and gone and all that, but go back and watch it again and look in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is there. What do you see? You see this person show up. You see a snake slither and then you see this person that's not really a person, sharp na we, we, the snake was there, the serpent was there, the dragon of old, he's here outside, he wants to get you, he wants to get me, but we have won, uh, because of Jesus. Well, there it is. Uh, notice, uh, notice there, there's a consequence for the, for the woman and, 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 and the serpent and the woman. Uh, there'll be conflict. But to the woman, he says in verse 16, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. A woman told me once, a member of this church told me once, a childbirth is like taking your upper lip and pulling it over the top of your head. I told her that's what having a kidney stone feels like the same thing. And uh, she didn't buy it, but there it is. There's pain in childbirth, yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So what happens, guys, in the fall is there's an essential conflict. Sin, sin enters the world. The, human, the man and the woman are fallen. The whole creation is fallen now. Uh, and, and, and the relationship structure is gone, gone wrong. Your desire will be for your husband. The word desire in the original Hebrew carries this idea of a desire bordering on disease. In other words, in other words, the woman's desire, which was for intimacy, a oneness before, now becomes a desire to control her husband. Ever experienced that? Don't go public with that. Um, <laughs> But the reality is, is that men have responses to that, and the responses is, no, 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 you're not going to rule over me. Some men get passive, but many men say, I am going to dominate you. And so we see the essential conflict in marriage as a part of the curse. Can the curse be undone in marriage? Yes, but only with the power of Christ. Can your marriage be successful? Yes, but only with the power of Christ. And even then, in a broken world, it's going to be difficult, right? And some of you say you've never had problems in marriage. You're not married. You lie about other things. Um, but, but the reality is we need brothers to help each other in marriage, right? Um, and, and, and every phase of life is different. I'm in a new phase. It's, it's different. Every phase of life is different. Uh, and, and so then to Adam, he says, because you listen to the voice of your wife. See, it's not always wrong to listen to the voice of your wife. That's not what Genesis is saying. But in this situation, Adam went passive. He listened to his wife when he shouldn't have listened to his wife, when he should have said no. And there is a time to say no. Kindly, gently, firmly. Honey, we're not going to do that. If you put a carte blanche yes to everything your wife says, she's the leader of the family. 
But the last I checked, it never changed that the Bible, we're called to be the leaders in our families. I need brothers to help me work through this. But that's the reality. And so because Adam, uh, Adam listened when he should have led, he was cursed. Work was cursed. Work is before. Work got harder. Work was, existed before the fall, right guys? Yeah, God created us to work. It's one of our core roles. It's a good thing to work. But work got harder. The curse is not to work. Don't ever buy that. Somebody said, yeah, because of the curse, because of the woman, I got to go to work. No, you get to go to work because you're made in the image of God. God's a worker and work is a great thing. It's just got a lot harder since Genesis 3. That is the worldview that shaped our country. Work and you'll be successful. Work and you can take care of your stuff. You can pay your bills, take care of your wife, take care of your work. It's a gift. It's going to be harder now. Uh, and, and so there it is. Act 5, the new history shaping normal. Verse 20. <sighs> What's done is done. Now the man called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments for skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Garments of skin. What happened? The first sacrifice. The first animal sacrifice. And God did it. Why did he do that? Because all of this points ahead. To what sacrifice? The sacrifice of Christ. There, there will be a seed from the woman who will come and he'll crush the head of the serpent. And so the rest of Genesis is kind of gearing up. Where is that seed that's going to put everything right? That's going to undo the chaos? That's going to put it all right? They, they were looking for him soon. And next week we're going to see that they were hoping in Genesis 4 that the seed of the woman would come that would redeem the world and said everything right didn't happen that quickly. Took hundreds, hundreds, thousands of years until the seed of the woman came. But in the meantime, God did an animal sacrifice because you see, you can't get right with the God of the universe without the shedding of blood, the book of Hebrews says. Got to be a shedding of blood. And so God sheds the blood of an animal, clothes these two in looking ahead to the sacrificial system that would be set up in the Old Testament uh, under Moses and then the, the, the shed blood of Jesus that would come way beyond that. A new history shaping normal has come. Um, and then, well, verses 22 through 24. She was the mother of all the living. Life goes on. Life goes on in a new normal of a fallen world where people have babies and live in a broken world. Things aren't perfect. Things are difficult. There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of challenge. And that's the way it's, but God gives hope. Uh, and there is this covenant of grace that is coming. When we get to Abraham, we're going to see it. Uh, and God covers them with his blood. A bloke, broken world. Um, here we are trying to live together in a broken world. How many of you had a fight before you left home this morning? Do not raise your hand. How many of you have a pit in your stomach right now because of a business appointment that you, uh, there were, some of those happened this morning, I can tell. Uh, how many of you have a pit in your stomach because of a business appointment today or of a relationship that has to be repaired or of a government that has to be worked with or the new normal is here. Don't get cynical with pagans. Don't be surprised. Pagans will be pagans. Don't be surprised if your Christian brothers and sisters mess up on you. Don't be surprised if your parents do stupid things from time to time. It's the world we live in. And Jesus has come, and Jesus can clean up the mess. And he will. That's why we cling to him. Not government. Talk about it around your table. I'll get you out of here on time.
got it all figured out. It's good to have, let's see, today we had Kevin, Kevin Hypes, Mark McMillan back there in the back, uh, Zach Swee, Tom, hi, good to see you again, have you back with us. Anybody else here for the first time again? All right, let's give these guys a round of applause, huh? Glad you guys made it. Listen, if you would like us to have your contact information, we'd like to have it. We'd like to uh, send people over to your house to raise money from you. So, no, we're not going to do it. But if you would like us to have your contact information, fill that out. We'll get you our e-blast. And uh, um, it'll really help us. Thank you. Invite your friends. Invite your enemies. That's how this works. A man is more likely to come to something that will benefit him if he's invited. Uh, so invite a friend. Keep asking until ad nauseum they tell you to bug off. Um, um, listen, our partners are important. We love having everybody in the game at some extent, some skin in the game. So thank you for your partnership with us at Forge. Read ahead and uh, uh, read in Genesis. Let me wrap up and get us out of here. <clears throat> uh, so did you answer the question, uh, are people basically good with a tendency to do evil? Or because of the fall, are people basically bad with a tendency sometimes to do good? That, yes, huh? <laughs> Guys, this is a major theological difference, but it shapes your worldview, doesn't it? And I think from Genesis 3, we have to understand that people are fallen. And that people are basically evil with a tendency sometimes to do good. And that they need Jesus to finally do good. And that 2 second, second Corinthians basically tells us that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. New, cre new creation. So that now, in Christ, we have the ability to do good, and yet we still sometimes do evil. And that explains why we still sin. Because the old nature is still there, but the new nature is in us, and God can enable us to, to do all things for his grace. We can, we can be his men. We can become great as he defines greatness because the gospel power is in us. Wrap it up as you walk out of here today. Uh, we learn a worldview that in Genesis 1, Adam and Eve are to blame, not God. So God's men, as they go out into a world that's broken, they don't go out as God blamers. They say, they understand that the, the issues are there, and I'm not going to blame God for everything. I understand it was my forefathers that did this. Uh, number two, I go out there understanding men as a man, specifically that passivity will kill me. Robert Lewis, a real man rejects passivity accepts responsibility, leads courageously, and expects the greater reward. And that greater reward is sometimes in this life and sometimes it's not. But it's from God. So men who become significant influencers in their families, work, church, um, are not God blamers. They are uh, not passive leaders either. I, I like what Fenelon said. Fenelon was a 17th century priest, one of my mentors. He said, so believe this and pay no attention to self. The old self is full of tricks and is more subtle than the serpent who deceived Eve. Happy is the soul who refuses to listen to self and refuses to pamper it, but listens to God himself. Don't pamper yourself. You're God's son. Lean on his grace, but push yourself, and I will too. As we see in Genesis, the whole world is broken, and there is no perfect system out there. There is systemic sin, and so business is broken, race relations are broken, churches are broken, Every system is broken. And those who tell you that there's a utopian system out there are lying. Because humans create systems. And there is systemic failure because there is systemic sin. Don't forget that. Don't buy the lies. Don't listen to them.
This shapes our worldview. And Jesus is coming again. You're going to clean up the mess. Until then, you and I have to wade out into it. And sometimes it's hip deep. Lean on your brothers. Lean on the gospel. Don't pamper yourself. Let me pray and then we'll get out into it. Thank you, Jesus, that we get to be your sons. Thank you that we get to follow you now. Thank you for the power of the gospel, that the cross is empty and so is the tomb, and that you fill us by your spirit. So fill us as we walk out of here. Give us the ability to see world, the world as you want us to see it and to trust in you and to have brothers as we go through it. I commit my brothers to you as we pray in the strong name of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's men said, amen. amen. Go get them. Go get them.